tonight on Canton Confidential. A frantic 911 call. It was a chaotic scene. People just kind of walking in and out. And evidence called into question. We decided on finding some type of pla temporary plastic evidence container. As new light is shed on old relationships. It's very clear to us that Katie McLaughlin perjured herself. We are bringing you all the headlines from day five of testimony. Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial starts right now. We've entered the second week of testimony. Good evening, I'm Glenn Jones. I'm JC Monahan. Reed, of course, accused of hitting her Boston police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe, with her SUV and leaving him to die in a blizzard in 2022. On the stand today were two more Canton police officers. But before we talk about today's testimony, let's quickly recap what happened last week. We had four days of testimony. We heard from a dozen witnesses, John O'Keefe's brother and his sister-in-law. They were the first to testify. They shared details of O'Keefe's life and his relationship with Reed. We learned O'Keefe and Reed had reconnected at the beginning of COVID after dating briefly back in 2004. On Friday, jurors stepped outside the courtroom and visited two sites in Canton. One of the bars where O'Keefe and Reed visited the night before his death and the front yard where his body was found. The jury also getting a close-up look at Karen Reed's vehicle when it was brought back to Fairview. Reed confirmed to us the vehicle is in fact hers. We also heard from first responders who gave accounts of what happened when they arrived at Fairview Road and what records were kept, though their accounts of exactly what Karen Reed said in those moments were slightly different. And that leads us to Katie McLaughlin of Canton Fire. She was one of the first responders on scene and claimed Karen Reed admitted to the killing while at the scene. But the defense at the start of court today accused her of perjury, given her relationship and friendship with Caitlin Albert. Albert's parents owned the home where O'Keefe's body was found. McLaughlin said she and Caitlin were only acquaintances and not good friends. But the defense challenged that, showing McLaughlin images of her and Caitlin together. More details came to light today. Katie McLaughlin and Caitlin Albert are standing next to each other in a photo at a baby shower in June of 2021, about eight months before John O'Keefe's death. Uh, it, it's very clear to us that Katie McLaughlin perjured herself. Now, it's really important to note here, the jury hasn't seen these images because they haven't been admitted as evidence. The defense has asked the judge to rule on whether they'll be allowed. Judge Canoni has not ruled on that yet. We have a lot still to unpack. Our Kirsten Glavin has been following every moment of this trial. She joins us live outside Denham Courthouse with some of the biggest takeaways from today's testimony. Kirsten. Well, guys, the jury is just starting to get a sense of just how small this town really is with multiple responding police officers already knowing the homeowners. There are multiple Canton connections now at play here. A second week of testimony in the Karen Reed murder trial. Some of John O'Keefe's family members tearfully listening to a 911 call made that morning. Attorneys from both sides also honing in on the Canton Police Department's methods of evidence collection. I was removing the snow layer by layer. Lieutenant Paul Gallagher explaining how he used a leaf blower to uncover a cocktail glass near where O'Keefe's body was found. We have the blood and then right here is the broken drink, drinking glass. Blood samples from the snow also collected. Uh, we decided on finding some type of pla temporary plastic evidence container. Uh, we were able to uh, find large uh, cups and we took six samples. Red Solo cups borrowed from a neighbor to hold the evidence. They're shown later in this photo, stored at the Canton Police Department in a stop and shop grocery bag near Reed's SUV. That appeared that those unsealed cups with blood, liquid blood in them are situated right near the right rear quarter panel of the SUV in this photograph? Yeah, to the rear of the vehicle, yes. Possible cross-contamination raised by the defense, along with questions as to why the home was never searched. Canton police only saying they recused themselves from interviews because of family ties and that there was no probable cause. We did not want to go on any investigative uh, interviews because one of our best investigators, name is Kevin Albert. He's the property owner's uh, brother, and we didn't think it would be appropriate 
um, if we were on those interviews questioning fam his family members. Family ties also under the microscope as a second witness, Canton Sergeant Sean Good, takes the stand. In addition to being a, a colleague, would you also consider Kevin Albert to be a friend? Uh, yeah, we've, we've socially hung out after work. Outside of court, Reed's defense capitalizing on the Canton connections. Are you concerned about the family ties in this case? Extremely, extremely concerned. Yeah, that's been at the heartbeat of this case from the very beginning. Now, after the jury was dismissed, we did hear some testimony from a sergeant who was one of the first to go inside of the Albert's home. The defense wants to bring up a 20 year old investigation that he took part in, as well as the Albert, Alberts, that resulted in an alleged wiped record. Now, that is something the judge says she's going to look into. She did request the police reports from that incident, so we'll wait and see if that is going to come into play here the latest live here in Dedham. I'm going to send it back to you guys in the studio. Okay, Kirsten, thank you. We're going to get into that in our conversations today here as well. Let's bring in our first guest tonight. Back in the studio with us is local attorney Catherine Luftis. You may also recognize her from her TikTok account, Note My Objection, and Michael Coyne, dean at Massachusetts School of Law, who will get on TikTok soon, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, let's start with you. There was a lot of talk about probable cause. And from the beginning, actually, why didn't they go to the door of the Alberts home, which is where John O'Keefe was found on that early morning hours? And today, Lieutenant Gallagher repeatedly said, no probable cause, no probable cause. They said, well, the defense said, well, you don't need probable cause to ask, to knock on the door and ask. Where do you fall in this? Can you just parcel it out a little bit? Absent permission, you cannot search someone's home without their uh, without probable cause existing. Probable cause simply means that you have evidence to support the commission of a crime within the house mm -hmm. or by the people within the house. And their, their testimony says we didn't believe we had probable cause at that point. All of the evidence we've seen so far, I think, would support it. Mm -hmm. the, the question really becomes, why don't you at least ask? But, but I'll be honest with you, if uh, I were representing them, and I think if most lawyers were representing them, I wouldn't have given you access to the home without permission to search. I don't know, who knows what was going on in the early morning hours uh, between midnight and 3 a.m. there. The fact is, is that uh, when they're searching and there's a dead body in your front yard, they're looking for evidence to convict you potentially. And so I would not have uh, told my clients to grant permission under the circumstances either. I would just say Lieutenant Gallagher really did sort of just really, he was very straightforward on that one. Every question he didn't hem or haw was no probable cause. End right. of story. Catherine, let's talk about another first responder here. Sure. Uh, one of the firefighters, uh, Katie McLaughlin, is being accused of perjury because of her alleged relationship with uh, Caitlin Albert. And the defense says it's evidence of that are social media pictures. Now, I don't believe everything I see on social media. Is that standard good enough to establish a relationship that she lied about? I, I think, the, to be quite honest, so we, we had the testimony from uh, firefighter Katie McLaughlin on Friday, and we had the uh, defense come back this morning and essentially say we were provided with additional photographs uh, uh, outlining the relationship on social media between Caitlin Albert and Katie McLaughlin. I think the word to throw around the word perjury is, is a little bit loose. I, I think that it really what it comes down to is potentially a mischaracterization of the relationship. So Katie McLaughlin talked about being acquaintances, whereas the defense wants her to admit that they're close friends. At the end of the day, I think who decides what acquaintances is really a subjective interpretation. And to say that she committed perjury is really that she told an untruth on the stand. I'm not sure that they get there. They really, they asked the questions that they wanted to. There was a, an individual voir dire conducted by the judge. Uh, she determined that the photos were excluded. So I think it's likely that they will be unable to uh, to go back down this And just to underscore one point, perjury is a crime. It so is. So what they're accusing her of is a crime. It is. It, that, and that's that, that's the ex accusation. I'm not sure that it quite rises to that level, but that's certainly the, the allegation that was. To made. circle back, those the pictures that they had brought up that the jurors didn't get to see because again the the judge had not decided whether or not they were admissible. Over the weekend, the internet sleuths went nuts I'm sure. and, and dug yeah. up more photos, and that's really why we started today with the defense saying, "Look, we, we showed you two on Friday, but we have a baby shower. This, this, this." Um, 
I, even if it doesn't get into the trial itself, that, that's out there again. This is another one of those, can you like earmuff it and like, la la la, I didn't hear any of that. I mean, it's, it's all the talk now. It, it's difficult and I think it's, it has to be pretty hard for the jury. In 2024, when we all have access to social media, we all have access to the internet to avoid any, you know, seeing any information. But ultimately, that's what they're tasked with doing. The judge asks, asks them every day, are you influenced by anything you've seen outside? And so, uh, you know, what I always tell to my followers, it doesn't matter what's being said on Twitter or in the blogs. It's what evidence the jury has in front of them, and that's what they have to consider. Well, another thing that the defense wants the jury to hear is about this alleged relationship between uh, Michael Lank of the Canton Police Department and the Alberts um, that go back 20 years. Um, what's your take on that? How do you think the judge is going to rule on the request to admit that relationship into evidence? She will admit the relationship on cross in all likelihood. The evidence of bias, uh, because it goes to the very core of whether your testimony is truthful or not, and whether they had a prior relationship for, of 20 plus years, whether uh, he has protected Mr. Albert in the past, and there is uh, evidence to support that in the federal complaint that was filed against him. Uh, that was subsequently settled. The judge will allow some of that evidence in because it strikes at the heart of whether that testimony is truthful. Uh, if these witnesses are biased, uh, that's something the jury is entitled to consider. And the judge doesn't have the same latitude of, on discretion with respect to bias. Well, at this point, it seems like they're accusing more people of bias on the stand than those who are, they are not making that accusation. Well, I of. mean, it's just, it's a small town. These, uh, these yep. people were born and raised there for most of, so of course there's going to be a connection. It's just whether or not, I guess, you believe the depth of it, the definition of acquaintance versus a friendship. It's going to be interesting to see how that it's Just one layer. Out. Yep. <laughs> we still have a lot more to explore this half hour. When we come back, we'll be joined by security analyst and retired state trooper Todd McGee about securing the crime scene and transporting the evidence. And as we go to break, another live look at the courthouse in Dedham. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Do you think it's standard practice for a police department to borrow red solo cups from a neighbor to gather evidence? Objection. You can go ahead and answer that, Lieutenant. Of course not. Nothing about the scene was standard. That is Canton Police Lieutenant Paul Gallagher. He was in charge of preserving the crime scene where John O'Keefe's body was found. We saw a video of Gallagher using a leaf blower right here in an attempt to blow away some of the snow and expose any possible evidence that was under there. Some of that evidence collected was blood, but the blood was frozen. Gallagher confirmed the cups used to collect the blood evidence were red solo cups provided by a member of the Canton Police Department who lived near the scene. Those cups were then transported in this stop and shop brown paper bag back to the police station. Lieutenant Gallagher said he had never processed a scene quite like this in the snow before. We're joined now by Todd McGee. He is a former Massachusetts State Trooper and a security analyst. Todd is joining us remotely tonight. Todd, let's go through this part sort of step by step. Let's first talk about the leaf blower. Okay, the officer, uh, uh, Lieutenant Gallagher said, you know what, he's never done anything like this before, not just the snowy scene, but also using a leaf blower. The video does seem to show them being careful. It wasn't as you think of it when you're going through the, your own yard, but how outside the box was the decision in the first place? Well, to use a leaf blower is not a conventional way of conducting your investigation. There's a high probability that you could blow away evidence uh, besides the obvious blood stains that appear here before the jury that was presented today in court. There may have been other items that could have been consistent with additional evidence, such as threads, such as clothing, uh, something from another individual that may have been involved in, in the death of, of Officer O'Keefe. Uh, so to use a snowblower is not something in my 24 years I've been being used as a, as a resource and tool during the middle of a murder investigation. All right, that context is really important, Todd. Let's talk then about the solo cups used to gather some of the blood that was on the snow at the scene. Of course, as a layman, I associate solo cups with drinking beer and playing flip cup games in college. It doesn't make sense to me that it would be used at a crime scene. Um, but this crime scene was unique. Is, there, is this warranted in any way from your perspective? 
there are a number of ways to collect blood samples and you know from swabbing and, and properly uh, putting these, these this type of evidence into some type of a secured something that's been sterilized because it's, it needs to be analyzed later on in the lab. So again, collection of evidence as well as the chain of custody is a critical aspect. And again, we have to understand that the physical evidence that being presented in court is something that both prosecution and defense are going to leverage if it helps their case in the case of the prosecution or if it helps Karen Reed in the case of the defense. We're, we're almost out of time. I'm, I'm sorry, Glenn. I was just going to say uh, just the optics aren't good, though. Would you agree that solo cups and a leaf blower doesn't sound good as, as good choices to make? Coming right out of the bat, very unconventional resource, something that I've seen in my 24-year career. Okay. Okay. Todd McGee, a security analyst and former Massachusetts state trooper, thank you. We want all of you out there to join in our Canton Confidential conversation. If you have something you'd like to ask us, then ask the experts. Send us an email at canton.confidential at nbcuni.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's day five of testimony in the Karen Reed murder trial. We're joined now by our very own court insider, Sue O'Connor, who I think has been there for each of those five days. I've almost, yeah? I think. I didn't get in the first day because oh, I wasn't that's right. there early enough. That's right. You're in the overflow room. It still counts. <laughs> so in, with each day, though, this, this case really does get more complicated, yeah. and a lot of it is about relationships. Yeah, you know, I mean, we all understand. If you come from a small town, I lived in Canton for a little while. I lived in Revere. People live there, they grow up, they become the police chief, they become the mayor, they sit on the board, they own restaurants. You know, it's not uncommon for this many overlaps of people to know each other. The complication here a little bit is you have this Boston police aspect of it, where Albert, who owned the home, was a Boston police officer. John O'Keefe, obviously, was a Boston police officer. And you have the layers of the police interacting with other law enforcement around the scene of an accident or a crime. You also have this layer of the Canton police who testified today that, you know, John O'Keefe wasn't officially dead when they removed him from the scene, so they didn't have authorization to have the state police come in and do a, uh, a an unintended dead body investigation. Um, so they started this investigation, as you've been talking about, mm -hmm. improvising. Yeah, leaf I mean, blowers and solo cups and brown paper bags. Every retired cop I have talked to said that when they hear the word improvi improvise from a younger police officer, they go, don't do it, don't do it, because this is where it often ends up, where the leaf blower might have ended up being a good idea, but it might be a better idea for the defense because if they kept saying how well it worked, but they didn't find any of the glass or any of the other evidence except for the blood and the broken glass. Right. So it's a very complicated layer of small town politics, people who went to elementary school with, with each other, as we've talked about earlier, firefighters who were friends or acquaintances with the daughter of the, you know, it's just layer upon layer of complication. All right, so Sue's been talking to us about the things that the jurors are hearing, but there were two big developments that the jurors haven't heard yet. This alleged perjury of uh, Katie McLaughlin, one of the first responders and her relationship with Caitlin Albert. And then also um, the Canton police officer, Michael Lank, yes. who apparently has some kind of longstanding relationship with one of the Alberts. Yes, and what was interesting about the Michael Lank, and again, the jury was not in the room for this. This was voir dire, so they're going to find out if they can introduce some information that they get about Michael Lank to the jury in the defense's cross. And <laughs> Canoni said this is trying to avoid a trial within a trial to make mm -hmm. it even more complicated, to your point. Right. Look, at Lank grew up with the Alberts. He has a relationship with them. He was involved as a police officer with an altercation uh, per, that Chris Albert, who is not a police officer, the brother of the person who owns the home, um, was saying he was getting beat up. He was being chased. And it ended with a criminal investigation and charge just into Lank. Remind as, us when this was. This, this was, was right 20, 20 years, years ago. ago. Okay, just right. to be clear, point, it has nothing that. to right. do. Nothing to do with right, right. now, which is why Canoni's like, it's a, tr we can't have a trial within a trial. So they're going to find a way, the defense, to introduce this information to the jury 
on cross to show that Lank might have a bias to protect the Alberts in some way because he grew up with them. Although he did say that his relationship with Brian Albert was civil, which in police talk doesn't mean I love you. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. All right, our court insider, Sue O'Connell, thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Testimony continues tomorrow at 9 a.m., another half day on a Tuesday, a half day in court. That's right. Remember, we're streaming the trial on our website, our YouTube page, as well as our sister station, NECN. The testimony has been riveting. And we'll be back here at 7 tomorrow night for another edition of Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial. J.C. Monahan and I will see you tomorrow. Have a good night.